Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining the Health Effects Institute for the final webinar in our 2021 conference series. My name is Eliane Van Vliet, and I'm a staff scientist at HEI. I'd like to acknowledge Dan Krauss, senior consulting scientist at HEI, who co-organized today's session, as well as all the staff who worked behind the scenes to put this webinar series together. Before we delve into today's webinar, I'd like to make a few housekeeping announcements. All attendees are muted for the duration of the webinar and questions will be reserved for the 25 minute Q&A and discussion at the end. You can submit your questions using the Q&A function at any time during the webinar and you can also upvote questions in the Q&A function. Uh, please contact us in the chat box if you experience any logistical issues and in case you've missed any of our seven previous webinars, all recordings will be available on our website within the next few weeks and you can find the links to the recordings and slides there. And finally, to help us improve the webinars, please complete the post webinar feedback survey, which will be emailed to you tomorrow. So today's webinar will focus on what has been learned about the health effects of long term exposures to low levels of air pollution. Results will be presented from three HEI funded studies conducted in large populations across the United States, Canada and Europe. We have an interesting session for you today and to lead our way through it's my honor to introduce today's session chairs. Dr. Amy Herring, who is a Sarah and Charles, Charles Ayers Professor of Statistical Science and Global Health at Duke University and a member of HEI's Research Committee. And Dr. Sferi Vidal, Professor Emeritus in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences at the University of Washington School of Public Health. He's also the chair of the HEI's Low Exposure Epidemiology Studies Review Panel. I will now hand over the mic to Dr. Herring, who will introduce the speakers. Thank you so much. It's very good to see you today, and I appreciate your joining. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, today's session will feature Robert O'Keefe from HEI, Dr. Daniel Braun of Harvard University, Dr. Tanya Christidis of Statistics Canada, Dr. Jay Chen of Utrecht University, and Dr. Sferi Vidal from the HEI Review Panel. As mentioned, you'll hear from these three speakers from the study teams. We'll hear commentary from Dr. Vidal on behalf of the review, and then we'll take questions from the audience. First, Bob O'Keefe will introduce this session and give some background on the set of studies funded by HEI to explore potential health effects at low levels of exposures. Bob O'Keefe has served as vice president of HEI for over two decades. He provides leadership for the Institute's major programs, including core, global, and energy, and leads the Institute's engagement with the US Congress and other domestic and international regulatory bodies. Prior to HEI, he served as Assistant Deputy Commissioner for Policy and Programs at the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. He's currently a member of the US EPA Mobile Sources Technical Review Subcommittee and Chair Emeritus of the Board of Clean Air Asia. I'd like to welcome Bob now. Thank you very much, uh, Amy, that was great. Appreciate your introduction. My slides are clear. They look good. Great, thanks. Um, the studies, um, oops, Let's see, these aren't advancing correctly. Let's see, there we go. Let me try again. I may need you to hop in here. I'm having a little trouble with the slides, but let me try one more time. Um, no, my advancing is not working for some reason. Um, are you able to advance my slides? Let me try one more thing. It's frozen. Um, are you able to advance my slides for me, please? I'll have to stop sharing, Bob, then I can share. Yeah, please do. Okay. If you can just stop sharing at the top. Yeah. That'd be Thanks. great. Thank you. Yep, 
Thanks so much, Elian. If you could go to slide two, and I apologize for that. Good morning uh, from Boston, everyone. Um, the studies we hear about today originated from HEI RFA 14-3. The overall objectives of the RFA were to fund studies to assess the health effects of exposure to low levels of ambient air pollution on all cause and cause specific mortality and morbidity. Also exposure response functions for PM 2.5 and other pollutants at low levels and to identify and develop statistical and other methodologies, including new and improved exposure surfaces and estimates in a couple of the studies. Slide, please. The motivation for HEI's low exposure studies recognized that despite significant advances in air pollution in recent decades, primarily in high income countries, several large epidemiological studies in, 20, 20, in 2012 found associations between PM 2.5 and mortality below the then current standards. With both ongoing and expected future reviews of national standards and guidelines by US EPA and EU and the WHO among others, HEI undertook these studies to inform risk assessment and regulatory decisions to help confirm whether health effects, adverse health effects continued at or below the current standards. The graph on the left depicts a steady decline in PM 2.5 levels that was observed in the US from 2000 to 2017. And the graph on the right illustrates the concentration response function from the Canadian study extending below the US and WHO standards and guidelines. Slide please. So what are the policy relevant questions these studies seek to help answer? First, a better understanding of concentration response relationships helps understand the shape of the relationship at very low and very high levels. For example, is there a threshold? And if so, at what level? It also helps assess whether a particular exposure may cause a specific effect and ultimately estimates the public health burdens from an exposure. These in turn provide a basis for at least two important policy questions. At what level should we set ambient air quality standards and to what level of exposure should we estimate public health impacts? Slide please. These studies when completed and reviewed, which they're close to being, are expected to contribute significantly by harnessing exceptionally large data sets to estimate exposure at very low levels, considering potential confounders to the maximum extent possible, and applying a range of analytic approaches to test sensitivity to model selection and possible causal inference. Slide. The three studies you'll hear about today were selected competitively, um, as are all HEI studies, and have several common and many unique features. Populations with millions in the United States, Canada, and Europe in both administrative and traditional cohorts. They relied on satellite data and ground level exposure measurements and high quality exposure assessments and models at high spatial resolutions. They also focused on development and application of the novel statistical methods needed to uh, conduct analyses in data sets of this scale. This is a map that'll be familiar to many of you. It shows locations of the three studies, obviously. Uh, first, the elapsed study by Bert Brunekrev conducted in uh, of University of Utrecht in the Netherlands, um, focuses on, um, was titled Mortality and Morbidity Effects of Long-Term Exposure to PM 2.5, Black Carbon, NO2, and Ozone. It was an analysis of European cohorts, including 28 million Europeans in, a pooled, in pooled data from the 10 escape cohorts and six large administrative cohorts. The Harvard study in the US led by Francesca Dominici assessed adverse health effects of long-term exposure to low levels of ambient pollution and focused on mortality and morbidity. They had a total of about 60 million uh, participants uh, in America, including 28.6 elderly Medicare enrollees, 28 million uh, Medicaid employees, and an additional 15,000 subjects from the Medicare beneficiary survey with individual level risk factor data. The pollutants included PM 2.5, NO2, and ozone again. The MAPLE study led by Michael Brower in Canada, he was from the University of British Columbia, focused on mortality, air pollution exposures in, in low income environments. And it included 8.5 million Canadians using Canadian national census data and an additional 540,000 participants in a Canadian community health survey with more individual level data. The participants, the uh, pollutant study there included PM 2.5, NO2, and ozone. And as mentioned earlier, to assess exposure, the teams used hybrid exposure models, including satellite data, incorporating satellite data, chemical transport models, routinely collected monitoring data validated, 
and land use and other variables. Slide, please. All of these studies were subject to the HEI oversight and, uh, and quality that, that we're all uh, quite familiar with, uh, beginning with an oversight committee chaired by John Samet from the University, uh, from the Colorado School of Public Health. And the teams were required to submit biannual progress reports, participate in webinars and meetings with the public and sometimes with sponsors, uh, and, and were subject to rigorous QAQC audits. As you'll hear, we impaneled a low exposure review panel chaired by Sferi Vidal, who you just met from the University of Washington and will speak a little bit later. The panel is conducting detailed peer review and will provide a commentary for each study. The results today include initial findings for the United States and Canada that were published after review in November, 2019. And this was to inform ongoing regulatory um, uh, decision-making that was occurring at the time, including at US EPA. The final comprehensive results are currently in peer review and will, publish, will be published with commentaries later this year. Because of the rich data sets that these studies generated, HEI is now funding additional individual and joint level analyses to further test the results. These include harmonized analysis across all three populations, additional causal analysis, and probing of relationships of multiple pollutants, shape, and covariance. Slide. This is the teams, you can't read these, but these slides will be on our website of remarkable scientists who conducted this work around from around the world. And I will say that we're quite privileged today to have um, most, if not all, of the, uh, the PIs available, Bert and Michael and, and Francesca, um, are available to answer questions along with the presenters when we get to the Q&A portion of today's session. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Bob. So now we'll start with our first lead off speaker, Dr. Danielle Braun. Danielle is senior research scientist in the biostatistics department at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and at the Department of Data Science at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Her areas of research include causal inference, measurement error, environmental health, risk prediction, genetic epidemiology, survival analysis, frailty models, clinical tool development, and comparative effectiveness research. Today, she'll make comparisons across studies with a focus on confounder control and causal modeling. Let's welcome Danielle. Thank you, Amy. Um, so I'm glad to be here. I'm gonna be presenting today, as Amy just said, on the effect of confounder control actually and causal modeling actually across the three different studies. Um, as Bob mentioned, some of this work has been uh, previously published and some of it is part of the team's uh, HEI final reports. So just to introduce um, kind of the context. So all the three studies assess the health effects of long-term exposure to low levels of ambient air pollution, uh, PM 2.5. So ideally you would randomize patients to low or high air pollution, but that's not feasible. So um, all three studies actually relied on uh, our observational studies. They relied on claims data um, to do the analysis, but claims data have limitations due to the lack of randomization. So there are factors that may be associated with both exposures and the health outcome, like socioeconomic status, that may actually confound the exposure comparisons. So the challenges that um, we're gonna talk about today, so there are some challenges due to unmeasured confounders. Um, so uh, individual level covariates may confound the exposure comparisons. Um, some individual level covariates were missing across all three studies, just um, because again, the studies relied on um, on claims data, um, but each team approached this uh, kind of and tried to overcome this challenge in a slightly uh, different way. And we'll talk through um, what each team did. And then uh, the second topic is how to adjust for measured confounders. And so oftentimes these con confounders are included as uh, linear terms in statistical models, but this could be actually sensitive to model misspecification. So we'll talk a bit about causal inference approaches that help um, that are a bit more robust to the model misspecification. Okay, sorry, my slides aren't advancing. Okay, um, so the first study that I'm going to talk about is the Maple study, um, and so uh, the Maple study relied on two different cohorts. The first is the Canadian Census Health and Environmental Cohort (CanCheck). Um, these are three census-based cohorts in three different years. Uh, they had 7.1 million respondents and 128 million person years. And so for this cohort, they had some individual level data and some um, contextual level data like uh, community size and neighborhood margin marginalization. 
Um, and then they had actually a second, um, more detailed uh, data set from the Canadian Community Health Survey, CCHS. And so that data set actually had additional information about health behavior. So that had information on smoking, on alcohol consumption, BMI, and other um, variables. The inclusion was uh, individuals who are greater than 25 years old. Um, they were censored at 89. And then the outcome that I'm gonna be talking actually throughout this talk today, um, we're just focusing on mortality. So they looked at non-accidental mortality. So the first thing that um, we're gonna go over is different uh, covariate, different ways, uh, different covariates included in the outcome model that the Maple study considered. So they actually looked at three different models um, and each one kind of with a varying uh, level of covariates included. So the first, and they did this both in the CANCHEC uh, cohort and the CCHS. And again, we're looking at the relationship between PM 2.5 and non-accidental mortality. And so the first model is an unadjusted model. Um, it doesn't include individual level covariates. And then the second model is uh, adding individual level covariates and then adding contextual covariates. So that's the data that's available in CANCHEC. Um, so we see here that the hazard ratios are still um, significant as we add more covariates. They're still statistically significant with a hazard ratio of 1.084. Um, and then for the CCHS, in addition to the comparison of the, the individual level covariates and the contextual, the contextual covariates, um, where you can see again that the hazard ratio is significant, they added the um, behavioral covariates that were available in this cohort and still results in a significant hazard ratio. Uh, these hazard ratio estimates are per 10 micrograms per um, meter cube. So uh, the other thing that the Maple study did was they uh, did an indirect adjustment for, uh, miss for the missing um, behavioral covariates in the CANCHEC cohort. So they used an uh, indirect adjustment via partition regression to adjust for the unmeasured covariates. So uh, the method actually uses a representative ancillary data set to estimate the associations between the missing variables in the primary data set. So that's the BMI and the smoking, for example, and the other behavioral uh, variables. And then they are able to leverage the complete set of covariates that's in the ancillary data set. So that's the um, CCHS data set that has all these individual level factors. Um, and so they're able to then produce an adjusted risk estimate for the variables in question here for the, um, uh, and, and they were able to adjust the hazard ratios for the association between PM 2.5 and mortality. So they did this, and again, their main study was the CANCHEC study. They used the 2001 CANCHEC study as the primary data set. And then they were able to leverage the um, 2001 CCHS as the ancillary matching data set that actually contained uh, the information like smoking and BMI that wasn't available in the main data set. So the results um, are published in, an, in a study in 2019. So we see here on uh, the hazard ratios, these are again per 10 micrograms uh, per meter cubed increase in PM 2.5. Um, they explored two different models. So model one includes uh, individual covariates and the model two includes the individual and contextual covariates. And then they um, applied the, they report the unadjusted and adjusted estimates both in the CANCHEC cohort, which are these, um, the first row and the third row here, and then in the CCHS uh, sub, uh, study. Um, so we see here actually that um, the results from the CCHS analysis, both from the CCHS analysis alone and the indirect adjustment, so we can see the adjusted compared to the unadjusted, um, they only suggest that these behavioral covariates only slightly confound the PM 2.5 mortality association. Um, so they concluded that missing data on the behavioral covariates was unlikely to significantly confound the um, associations in these studies. And again, you can see that the hazard ratios um, do change slightly, but are still statistically significant. Um, so I'm going to transition and talk about uh, the elapsed study and how um, uh, they handled this issue. Um, so the LAF study, uh, as Bob mentioned, so um, the, we're, I'm going to focus on results from uh, large administrative cohorts from seven countries in Europe. Um, that includes over 28 million people. Um, the inclusion criteria was 30 years old um, or, um, or older at baseline. And uh, again, they looked at non-accidental mortality. 
So in terms of covariate adjustment, uh, they also consider different models with varying level of adjustment. So uh, to, again, evaluate the associations between PM2.5 and non-accidental mortality, uh, their first model included only age, uh, sex, and calendar years. And then they added individual level variables um, that were available within each cohort as model two. And then model three adds to um, model two, the socioeconomic status uh, and other variables. So uh, the results from the comparison of the three models are presented here. Uh, please note that the hazard ratios here are now per five micrograms per meter cube increase in PM2.5. Um, and this is uh, the results are presented for each cohort. And so we see here that actually um, in all the cohort, as, as we go from model one to model three, we do see some changes in the hazard ratios. Uh, it's interesting that for some cohorts, actually uh, the hazard ratios are increasing as you uh, add more and more um, covariates into the model. And for others, we actually see a decrease in the hazard ratios, um, for example, in the Dutch and the English cohort. So ELAPS also did the indirect adjustment method to try to adjust for the un, uh, unmeasured um, uh, potential uh, behavioral confounders like smoking status and BMI. Um, and so they applied actually the same method by Shin et al. Um, and they were again looking at the uh, at natural cause mortality uh, and PM 2.5. So they were able to leverage as their ancillary data set, they were able to leverage actually um, surveys on variables like smoking, alcohol use and BMI. So they were able to leverage that in, in these countries in the Netherlands, Switzerland, Norway, Belgium, and Denmark. The English court actually already had individual level data on smoking and BMI. So there was no need to actually do the indirect adjustment on that, in that cohort. So in terms of the results, um, so we see here that um, in some of the uh, countries, so these are the results by country, this is for PM 2.5, we see the hazard ratio in the main model, and then we see the hazard ratio with the indirect um, adjustment. And again, their hazard ratios are per five micrograms per uh, meter cubed uh, increase in, two, in PM 2.5. And so for some countries like the Dutch, the Swiss, the Norwegians, um, the hazard ratios were actually attenuated, but they still remained mostly significant. I think there was one uh, borderline in the Dutch uh, cohort. Um, and then in the Rome and Belgium, the hazard ratios actually increased after the indirect adjustment. So uh, the third study is the Harvard uh, study using the Medicare data set. So, um, we had data from Medicare, which is a national uh, health, uh, prog health, health program for um, individuals over 65 uh, in the US. Uh, we have over 68.5 million observations. We were actually, we looked at all cause mortality. So compared to the other two studies, um, we had data on all cause mortality. So um, the first set of results that I'm going to present are how we approach this uh, covariate adjustment. So the Medicare data actually contained very little information about the individual level covariates, but we were able to actually uh, obtain more detailed information for a subset of individuals that are enrolled in the Medicare current um, beneficiary survey, the MCBS. And so this is uh, an annual phone survey. It's meant to be nationally representative of Medicare beneficiaries. Uh, we had information on more than 150 potential individual confounders and risk factors. Um, and so we analyzed the data for um, this cohort of 32,000 beneficiaries. So in terms of the results, um, the results here that were presented in this publication actually compare the um, uh, compare the hazard ratios using all variables to those that are available in Medicare only. Um, and these hazard ratios uh, are actually uh, attributable to an increase in long-term average PM 2.5 from less than 12 to greater than 12 for the full cohort and eight was used as a cutoff. So actually the exposure here um, was uh, dichotomized to be a binary exposure. And we see here that actually um, in terms of the, the, the covariates, we see very similar hazard ratios in the low pollution cohort. And in the full cohort, we do um, see slight uh, differences, but the confidence intervals are overlapping. So the last um, topic of this presentation is actually going to focus on causal inference, uh, causal inference adjustment for measurement confounders. 
um, and the work that we've done in the Harvard Medicare cohort on this. So causal inference methods are designed to really bridge the gap between the observational studies and randomized experiments. They're um, more robust to model misspecification. So um, we actually applied various traditional and causal inference approaches, and we conducted a quite extensive sensitivity analysis. Um, we relied on publicly available data, and we provide the code in the GitHub. So you're welcome to um, actually go to the GitHub and, and download that code, and use it. Um, the, in terms of the results, and this is published in 2020, um, we see actually, so on the left here is our hazard ratios. This is per 10 micrograms per meter cubed increase in PM. Uh, we're looking again at all cause mortality. Um, this on the left is the entire cohort. And so we see, we compare different approaches, a Cox model, a Poisson model, and then three causal inference approaches of matching, weighting, um, or uh, adjustment using the generalized propensity score as a covariate in the model. And we see that the hazard ratios are actually quite robust um, and with overlapping confidence intervals. And then on the right, we actually focus on uh, Medicare enrollees uh, exposed to low air pollution, less than 12 micrograms per meter cubed. And we see here that um, the matching weighting and the adjustment are actually uh, slightly lower, but still uh, very much statistically significant hazard ratios compared to the um, Cox and Poisson model uh, regressions. So one advantage of um, the causal modeling is it allows us to kind of assess the quality of the causal inference approaches that recovering the randomized experiments. And one way to do that is to look at um, and evaluate covariate balance for each confounder. And so the idea is that um, we have here the absolute correlation between PM and each of the potential confounders. And we have the unadjusted absolute correlation. And then after, after you match uh, in green or uh, way in blue, we're able to get, um, we're able to create a pseudopopulation. Once again, on that pseudopopulation, evaluate the absolute correlation. And so ideally, um, a good, uh, a good causal inference uh, approach uh, creates a pseudopopulation that would have an absolute correlation here of less than uh, 0.1 for all the covariates. And we see that actually, indeed, like for um, the matching is able to achieve that uh, for almost all of the covariates um, and even weighting does quite well. So um, this kind of gives us a sense that we, that we were able to, um, to create a pseudopopulation that's meant to mimic, um, again, the randomized control study. So just to conclude, um, so all three studies had some missing data on the behavioral covariates. Um, they're unlikely to significantly confound the PM mortality relationship. Uh, in the Medicare cohort, we used the five different approaches and all of those led to similar hazard ratio, which is um, great and shows that kind of the estimates are robust. Um, we provide the GitHub code, so um, these estimates are reproducible um, and really, uh, provide evidence on the causal link between PM and mortality. So in terms of ongoing work, so as Bob mentioned, like all, all three teams are working on, a harmonized, on harmonizing the analysis. Uh, we're working on harmonizing confounders and models across the data set. And then in addition, the LAPS and the MAPLE team are actually working on apply, applying the causal inference approaches that I described today. And just acknowledgement, so, um, as you all know, so this work was um, funded by the Health Effects Institute. So thank you. Thanks so much, Danielle. We really appreciate such a clear and informative presentation. Uh, I see a couple of questions already in the Q&A. Please keep those coming and we'll address them in our discussion time at the end of all the presentations. So today's next speaker I'm happy to introduce is Dr. Tanya Krasidis. She works as a research analyst at Statistics Canada's Health Analysis Division in Ottawa. She's worked extensively with the cohorts that are used in the MAPLE project, including in data validation, knowledge translation, and the creation and analysis of environmental exposed cohorts to examine the relationship between a variety of different outcomes and exposures. Her PhD research examined risk perceptions and health impacts related to wind turbines and she previously worked as a student researcher at the Public Health Agency of Canada, exploring risks related to foodborne, environmental, and zoonotic infectious diseases. Today, she will share work comparing different concentration response functions in these studies. And now I'll turn it over to you. 
Hi, I see a bit of a lag, so I'm just going to wait until I see someone that's not Amy in that little corner, but maybe that's just what it's like. Uh, can Amy, can you, you see the me? Slides. Yeah, I can see you and the slides. Okay. Well, I'll just stare at your face then. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for that introduction. Um, so in this presentation, I will be discussing the relationship between exposure and outcome and how it's been modeled in these three studies. I will go through the linear models, the concentration response functions, and then briefly how these relationships um, exist at the lowest exposure levels. Next slide. So first things first, what do linear models tell us? So in the chart, you'll see um, the results of the most comparable linear models between our three projects. These are the fully adjusted models from our administrative cohorts um, with varying uh, classifications of mortality. And I've also included the person years. You'll see that um, the elapsed cohort had the highest hazard ratio at 1.109, followed by uh, Maple at 1.084 and Medicare at 1.066. Uh, so these hazard ratios indicate anywhere from a 6 to 11% increased risk of mortality from exposure to PM2.5 per 10 micrograms per meters cubed. Uh, and it's worth noting that these results are broadly similar, and you can see that the confidence intervals overlap. Next slide. So linear models are limited in that they assume the same relationship between PM2.5 and mortality at all levels of PM2.5 exposure. The same is true for confounders, which are assumed to impact the relationship between PM2.5 uniformly at all levels. And linear models do not provide insight into a threshold at which exposure does not lead to mortality. Next slide. So therefore, in addition to linear models, we plot the concentration response functions so that we can allow for different relationships between PM2.5 and mortality at different levels of exposure. So if you look at this graphic that I've included, you can see that you can establish some points or knots with your data and then connect them in a variety of different ways. And so the method that you choose to connect those dots has an impact on the predicted values uh, between those knots, as you can see in these three plots. So for example, a cubic spline allows for each pair of knots to be connected by a different shape or curve, which allows for a different relationship um, at different levels of PM. And the smoothness or curvature of this shape can be controlled by the number and placement of knots and or a smoothing parameter. Next slide. There are some limitations of cubic splines. Uh, this is an example from the Maple work and we produced restricted cubic splines ranging from three to 18 knots. And you can see as we move along, the curves become more wiggly. The red one is the best fitting spline that I'll discuss later. So the challenge that we uh, find is to find a flexible curve that best represents our data, but that uh, also to keep in mind that a wiggly spline uh, may be a better fit, but is not necessarily useful for risk assessment. Next slide. So in the elapsed study, they used a natural spline and examined natural cause mortality. They decided to investigate one to three knots a priori, and I'm showing their preferred plot here, which used two knots. The red dotted lines um, indicate air quality guidelines, and the histogram is the distribution of exposures within their cohort. So you can see that the spline is linear below the lowest and above the highest knot concentrations, and there are no wiggles. You can also see that there is no low level threshold for the mean predictions and a flattening of the curve at higher concentrations. Next slide. In Maple, we used a restricted cubic spline. And here I'm showing the spline for non-accidental mortality. We selected the best fitting restricted cubic spline by using a controlled search between three and 18 knots, which I showed uh, before. Uh, and we found that the best fitting spline was nine knots. And you can see that it's wiggly between five and 12 micrograms per meters cubed. The lower confidence interval is above one, starting at 2.9 micrograms per meters cubed which is close to a minimum of 2.5 micrograms per meters cubed. And this result was insensitive to the number of knots that we included. Next slide. 
In the Medicare study, they fit their curve within a causal inference framework with one kernel equivalent to, you know, a knot or a person um, for, for each point. Um, so this curve is for all-cause mortality. What we see is there are gradual changes in the curvature with an increase at the low concentrations, a bit of a flattening, a little bit of an increase again, and then a flattening again. Their uh, curve is almost linear at levels uh, lower than current standards, and they controlled their curvature with smoothing parameters. Next slide. So why do we smooth the curvature? As I said previously, you have to remove the wiggles and extreme curvature in order to create a curve that is meaningful for risk assessment. In ELAPS and MAPLE, we used a different approach to smooth and control the curvature. ELAPS used the shape-constrained health impact function, um, which we call the shift. This creates a family of plausible sigmoidal shapes to fit the data. Curvature is controlled by limiting the range of parameters. And then the model is a weighted average by log likelihood of all of the shapes examined. Next slide. So here I have shown uh, the elapsed spline again to the left and uh, the shift to the right. You can see that when modeled by the shift, the uh, shape is super linear and has lower uncertainty at the minimum. And the lower confidence interval is above one at five micrograms per meters cubed. The shift has some limitations. Each shift is fit to the entirety of the data, which means there's no local fitting at low levels where data are sparse. So this leads to difficulty in picking up the shape in areas where, um, where data are sparse. Further, the shift family may not cover all possible shapes of interest due to computational limitation. Next slide which leads us to the E shift, which is what was used by Mabel. This is the extended shift, which uses a spline to fit the data rather than a sigmoidal function, uh, just because splines are more flexible for a controlling curvature. So in doing so, this puts weight on the full distribution of points rather than the areas where the majority of the points lie. And this helps to ensure that we are plotting the data at the tails more accurately. This means that the E shift maintains uncertainty at low concentrations. You can see also that the shift is uh, super linear, and that's the line that's in blue. And um, you can compare it to the spline that is in red. And we have also maintained the lower confidence interval here uh, in the shift that was um, predicted by the spline. So it's worth noting that both the shift and the e-shift can be directly implemented uh, in air quality assessment research and benefits analysis, but do not fully characterize uh, the concentration response function. Next slide. So to follow up on these findings, all of the teams uh, explored associations at select lower concentrations. We wanted to know what the lowest concentration is at which we have evidence of a relationship between PM2.5 and mortality. So to do this, each project applied different criteria to retain persons or person years with exposures below certain levels, which were broadly aligned with air quality guidelines. Elapse restricted to persons who had uh, exposures under 25, 20, 15, 12, and 10 micrograms per meters cubed, and Medicare and Maple restricted to those with 12 uh, and under. Next slide. So here I am only presenting the results under 12 micrograms per meters cubed as they are the most comparable between projects. Uh, and I've also included the person years, which you'll note are different for the um, smaller subpopulations. So you can see that there's a substantial increase in the Medicare cohort when limiting only to those with exposures under 12 micrograms per meters cubed. We go from 1.066 to 1.369. Elapse also found an increased risk, um, but with under the 12, um, under 12 micrograms per meters cubed subpopulation, um, even though the hazard ratio goes up to 1.199 from 1.109, um, within Elapse, this is a relatively small subpopulation who have been exposed to under 12 micrograms per meters cubed. So you can see that the confidence interval is wide. And in Maple, uh, the full cohort had a hazard ratio of 1.084, and we found a decreased risk um, for those who had exposures under 12 with a hazard ratio of 1.062, although the confidence intervals are overlapping. So we see that uh, risk remains even for those who have only had low level exposures. And in the case of a lapse in Medicare, 
the risk was actually increased for those who had expo been exposed to low levels. Uh, and it should be noted, of course, that there's high uncertainty in these subpopulations. Next slide. And so uh, just <laughs> one last function, um, with, which is a standard threshold model that we produced in the Maple Project. Uh, this is a standard threshold model uh, with thresholds from 2.5 to 10 microgram per meters cubed by increments of 0 0.5. The linear models that we produced were weighted with an ensemble weighting function. So we weighted all the models by log likelihood. And you can see that most of the weight is in the range of 2.5 to 3.5, and the fit decreased as the threshold increased, as seen by the widening confidence interval. And the mean of the threshold was always above one, and the lower confidence interval was above one at 3.5 micrograms per meters cube. So this is just further evidence of a positive association at low levels. Next slide. So to summarize, there is evidence for the PM2.5 mortality association at low levels in all three studies. The maple and elapsed concentration response functions were super linear with the steepest slope at low levels and a plateau at high levels. This indicates that with increasing concentrations, the marginal changes in risk appear to decline. The Medicare function was near linear and indicated aggravated effects at all levels of PM2.5. So the main conclusion is that positive associations between PM2.5 and mortality are observed even at the lowest levels. Next slide. So moving forward, as Danielle mentioned, each team uh, will try to do some harmonized work together. So we will all be using the E-SHIP, uh, using our administrative cohorts only, limiting to those who are age 65 plus. We are going to harmonize our covariates as best possible and use the same PM2.5 exposure, uh, the Maple version 2M, and we will all examine um, the same mortality classification. Uh, next slide. That's it, thanks. Thanks so much, Tanya. I really appreciate your presentation and I uh, see a question or two about it and we'll get to those again at the end of the session. Please remember to use the Q&A feature rather than the chat to uh, track your questions so that we can keep track of those ourselves and make sure we get to all that we can. So now we'll move to our next speaker, uh, who is Dr. Jay Chen. Uh, Jay is currently doing her postdoctoral research at Utrecht University. She's been working as the project manager of the ELAPS study. Her research focuses on air pollution exposure assessment and air pollution epidemiology. She was also a member of the systematic review team working for the update of the WHO Global Air Quality Guidelines under the supervision of Dr. Harai Hook. Dr. Chen will produce will present results from multi-pollutant analyses. And so I'll turn it over to you, Jay. Thanks, Amy. Um, so I hope you can see my slides. Um, Looks so great. I'm going, yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to present the results from multi-pollutant analysis in these three projects. Most air pollution epidemiological studies have focused on single pollutant research because it's easy to conduct and interpret. Um, but in single pollutant models, it's not clear whether the observed association reflects the effect of the analyzed pollutant or if it acts as, as a surrogate for another pollutant possibly originating from the same source. And as the human body is exposed uh, to multiple uh, air pollutants simultaneously, uh, the, single, the single pollutant models cannot characterize the complexity of the exposures and their health impacts. So the limitations of single pollutant mo models uh, lead to the shift towards uh, multi-pollutant approaches. One of the objectives of the multi-pollutant analysis is to estimate the independent effect of a single pollutant in the presence of other pollutants. And still there are a number of challenges uh, in interpreting results from multi-pollutant analysis. For example, uh, in conventional linear regression models, the results will be highly unstable when incorporating two or more pollutants that are highly correlated and the different measurement errors of different pollutants uh, as to the complexity of the interpretation because uh, the pollutant with the highest measurement error may show the most consistent associations in multi-pollutant analysis. 
And in most uh, statistical models, pollutants are treated symmetrically, whereas in reality, um, uh, air pollution can be divided into groups based on their emission sources, and some pollutants are precursors to others. And uh, ideally, the inclusion of multi-pollutants uh, in a statistical model should be supported by biologic um, mechanisms from other disciplines, such as toxicology. So in this presentation, I will share some experience in interpreting results from multiple pollutant analysis uh, in these three projects. So I'll first start with the maple, the results from the maple team. And the maple uh, investigated the associations between uh, mortality and long-term exposure to PM2.5. And they also uh, examined, explored uh, the sensitivity of the association to uh, adjustment for ozone and ox. And ox here was used uh, to approximate a combined oxygen capacity of ozone and NO2. So NO2 was not uh, directly examined in the maple study. This table shows the associations between PM2.5 and non-accidental mortality. Uh, and in single potent models, we can see that the in fact, uh, the associations between uh, PM2.5 and mortality are similar in the stack contract cohort and in the CCHS. And in two pollutant models with adjustment for ozone, uh, the association attenuated. And with adjustment for ox, the association between PM2.5 and mortality further attenuated. And in CCHS, the uh, hazard ratio reduced to unity. In, uh, in this uh, regular two pollutant models, the oxygen gases were included as linear terms. So the MAPLE team uh, further performed stratified analysis to examine uh, the association in, in the turtiles of, uh, of the oxygen gases. So here we can see that uh, in all the turtiles of ozone, we observed uh, significantly positive association between PM2.5 and uh, mortality. And uh, the significantly positive association for PM2.5 was only limited to the highest turtile of ox. And if we look at uh, the uh, exposure surfaces of the oxygen uh, gases, so this is ozone and this is ox, uh, we can see a clear special uh, variation in the uh, exposure distributions. So the difference uh, in the observed association in different, uh, in, in the turtiles of the oxidant gases uh, could be explained by the specially varying uh, health impacts of PM2.5. So the maple team uh, observed the strongest association between PM2.5 and mortality in areas with higher oxidant gases, and the observed impact of oxidant gases on, on associations for PM2.5 likely reflects the special variations uh, in atmospheric processes or sources that can impact the toxicity of overall air pollution mixtures and not a direct biological impact. We'll continue with um, results from the ELAPS study. So in ELAPS, we uh, investigated uh, exposures to PM2.5, NO2, black carbon, and ozone. And we performed two pollutant linear models for all combinations of these four pollutants. This table shows the results from the uh, pooled cohort. So here we can see that in single pollutant models, we observed uh, significantly positive associations for non-accidental mortality with uh, PM2.5, NO2, and black carbon. And in two pollutant models with adjustment for other pollutants, uh, the association attenuated. Uh, but um, the, the associations uh, remained significantly positive, except for the hazard ratio for black carbon adjusted for NO2. Uh, this is uh, more difficult to interpret because uh, the because uh, both NO2 and black carbon uh, reflects emission from traffic 
and other combustion sources. And the uh, correlation between these two pollutants uh, is high in this study. And this is also reflected by the substantially wider confidence interval compared compare to the single pollutant estimate. And uh, for ozone, we observed a significantly negative association in single pollutant model. And in two pollutant models with adjustment for other pollutants, the association attenuated but uh, remained statistically significant. And this table shows the results from seven administrative cohorts by meta analysis. So again, we observed significantly positive associations for uh, non accidental mortality with PM2.5, NO2, and black carbon. And with adjustment for other pollutants in two pollutant models, uh, we observed uh, attenuations in the association for PM2.5. And especially after adjustment for NO2, the uh, hazard ratio for PM2.5 attenuated uh, to unity. And for ozone, the associations uh, remained robust in two pollutant models. And for uh, black carbon, uh, here the same story after adjustment for NO2. And for ozone, we observed a significantly negative association in the single pollutant model. And in two pollutant models, the associations uh, attenuated uh, and become insignificant. So in ELAPS, we observed uh, associations for non-accidental mortality, not only for PM2.5, but also for NO2. The hazard ratio for PM2.5 reduced with the adjustment for NO2 cannot be simply interpreted as an artifact uh, related to um, multicollinearity because uh, the correlation between PM2.5 and NO2 is moderate and the width of the confidence interval only modest, modestly increased uh, in two pollutant models compared to uh, the single pollutant model. And uh, the observed NO2 association may reflect the direct effect of NO2 or correlated combustion related particles, such as ultrafine particles. And the reduction of the PM2.5 has a ratio did not implied that the particles had not effect in our setting because uh, adjustment for NO2 also adjusted for particles from the sources shared with NO2, including motorized traffic and other fossil fuel combustion sources. And the differential uh, measurement error may also explain the more robust associations observed for uh, NO2 in, uh, in pollutant models. So in, then, then in Med Medicare, uh, they, observe, um, they investigated uh, long-term exposures to uh, PM2.5, NO2, and ozone. And in an earlier publication, they uh, reported results from two pollutant uh, linear models uh, with PM2.5 and ozone. And here we can see that the, uh, the in single pollutant models, the association with all cause mortality uh, are significantly positive for both PM2.5 and ozone. And in two pollutant model, with adjustment for the other pollutant, uh, the, the association uh, attenuated uh, slightly for PM2.5. And the um, Harvard team also applied uh, the GPS matching method to uh, estimate the causal exposure response curve for air pollution and all cause mortality. So here, the plus. In the left panel shows uh, the results from single pollutant models. And the plots in the right panel shows results from the multi-pollutant models uh, adjusting for the other two pollutants as uh, uh, potential confounders. So here we can see that the exposure response curve for PM2.5 are almost uh, linear. And after adjusting for uh, other two pollutants, the, uh, the uh, causal impact of PM2.5 is uh, attenuated slightly. And the exposure response curve for uh, NO2 is not, are not uh, linear. And uh, adjusting for the other two pollutants uh, elevated uh, the, the, the health impact of NO2 because the, the um, Y scale is 
the scale of the y-axis is defined in these two plots. And uh, for ozone, uh, the increased uh, hazard for ozone is observed uh, for exposures higher than 45 ppb. And uh, the exposure response curve is not sensitive to the adjustment for the other two pollutants. So in summary, uh, the statistical methods applied and the pollutants examined are different, are slightly different uh, in uh, the three projects. Um, and the three um, projects consistently uh, observed attenuated associations between PM2.5 and mortality after uh, adjusting for other pollutants. Uh, but when interpreting the results, uh, some factors should be taken into account. Um, uh, for example, the special variation of the exposure distributions and the emission sources uh, of the pollutants and the correlations between pollutants. In terms of ongoing work, um, each team will apply uh, multi-pollutant approaches that were applied previously by the other two teams. And the Harvard and the ELAPS teams will additionally assess uh, OX as an uh, approximate for the combined uh, oxidant capacity of uh, ozone and NO2. And the Harvard and Maple teams will use the same PM2.5 and NO2 exposure surfaces. That's it. Listening. Thanks so much, Jay. I really appreciate your presentation. And if you can go ahead and uh, take your slides down. All right. Um, so now we'll move on to commentary uh, from my co chair, uh, Dr. Sperry Vidal, uh, who is Emeritus Professor in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences at University of Washington School of Public Health. His academic career was spent as a pulmonary physician and epidemiologist with a strong focus on air pollution health effects research. He served for many years on the EPA Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee and on the HEI Review Committee. In the years before he retired from University of Washington in 2019, he worked part of each year in China, collaborating on air pollution research with investigators at the Chinese Research Academy of Environmental Sciences in Beijing. In addition to maintaining curtailed research activities, he chairs the HEI review panel of the Low Exposure Levels Research Program and is here to provide commentary and critique on these three studies. Uh, so Jay, I think we need you to pull off your screen right and then Sperry should be good to go. Thank you, Amy, and uh, good uh, good uh, good morning to everyone. Um, is that uh, Mary, full are you able to put this in full screen mode? I, I'm, tr uh, I'm, tr I'm trying. Uh, I, I saw hold on, hold on. You. Okay, I got it. I got it. <laughs> Perfect. There it is. All right. Um, so I am going to make some selected comments about the about the studies that you've heard about. Uh, I've made a I have a, a list here of of uh, some observations that I made two years ago when I made uh, a report from the review panel uh, on this set of studies and some of the earlier work. And a lot of it still pertains. Uh, the first one is the issue of the plausibility of low uh, level effects. And at that time, I made the point that our, our Bayesian uh, priors were probably pretty low and they'd probably been nudged up a little bit here in the, or maybe perhaps more than a little bit than the, in the ensuing two years. Um, should also understand that it's likely that there are fewer people that are susceptible to dying at low concentrations. So we have, as you see in these three studies, lots and lots of data. But one of the issues that one is faced with with lots of data and, uh, data, and it's, it's uh, a problem that's been faced by these investigators is that the quality of the data sometimes deteriorates as the size of the data set increases uh, and other approaches have been 
needed in order to enhance the quality of the data. In these particular instances, the information on important covariates. Um, you've been uh, you've been presented with a lot of new uh, and advanced statistical methods uh, applied in novel ways uh, to this area. And then, um, and then finally is the issue of causal modeling, which is rearing its head here. And uh, I, I posed the question the last time, um, whether this was in fact a revolution in the way we uh, assess observational data, or is it just another way, another addition to our toolkit uh, for handling confounding? And I'll circle back to several of these as I continue. You heard about the three studies. We're now in the uh, at, in the final uh, report stages uh, that are in various stages of completion. Some are pretty much finished. Uh, and the three topics for today you've heard about: multi pollutant modeling, control of confounding, including causal modeling, and then the issue of concentration response functions. I'm going to go through each of those three themes. Um, with respect to each study. And I'm gonna try not to overlap with a lot of that has been presented and simply extract some points that I think merit some attention. So first of all, uh, I'm gonna talk about the multi-pollutant modeling uh, issue uh, that you heard about. Um, all of the, uh, and start first of all with Ma the Maple study in Canada. Um, all of the studies have essentially used uh, additional data um, to, uh, on covariates, um, and and I've also predicted uh, particle or pollutant concentrations at varying degrees of spatial resolution. So, here in Canada, PM 2.5 was predicted at a one by one kilometer uh, spatial resolution. Nitrogen dioxide at a 100 by 100 meter uh, uh, spatial resolution, and then ozone and oxidant uh, pollution at initially at 21 by 21 kilometers and more in the more recent years at 10 uh, kilometers. One of the more the marked with respect to multi-pollutant modeling in, in Maple was the marked attenuation of the PM 2.5 effect uh, by both ozone and the, their oxidant uh, metric. Uh, and then uh, substantial effect modification by the oxidant gases with the association essentially being strongest at the higher, um, higher levels. Um, one of the issues that this raises, and it's, it's, raises, it's raised with all multi-pollutant modeling is, is uh, what it actually means to control for other pollutants. And the example, it really rears its head with respect to ozone as well as oxidant gases. And you heard the characterization of, the, uh, of this association or this effect as not a direct biological impact of the oxidant gases themselves. That is, it's not, the, the argument there is that it's not reflecting actually the effect of ozone um, uh, on, um, as a confounder of the uh, PM association. And, and this is, this is mo motivated uh, in some part, in some degree, at least by what we know about the very uh, tenuous link between ambient concentrations of ozone and, uh, and exposure uh, to ozone. In, uh, in the laps, uh, you heard about the two large uh, cohorts the predictions in, in a lapse were at a fine spatial scale. So all of the pollutants were predicted at uh, 100 by 100 uh, meters. Uh, one thing to keep note of in a lapse is that very few uh, of the countries that are included in these cohorts had what we would consider to be low concentrations. So for example, Norway in the administrative cohort, uh, Stockholm and Sweden uh, in the pooled cohort. Again, we see marked moderate attenuation of the PM um, uh, association in one of the cohorts, and a very uh, much more marked uh, attenuation in the administrative cohort. You also heard that the NO2 association was not affected by inclusion of co pollutants, and the, and the issue of ozone uh, as a negative uh, uh, effect, that is, lower. Uh, hazard ratios with increases in ozone remained essentially negative with adjustment for coal pollutants. One of the issues to consider is, is, is this attenuation 
due to confounding by these co-pollutants. That is, do we, can we take this as at face value? And I, I alluded to the, to the issue earlier is that uh, it may not be <laughs> an issue of, of confounding by co-pollutants and may reflect some of the things that were, that were br brought up in the, in the presentation about differential measurement error and other issues, or the fact that they're actually reflecting something about atmospheric processes and aren't really uh, measuring uh, impacts of the pollutants themselves. The issue of ozone and the negative associations is sort of an example of how these sorts of issues rear their head and make it difficult to interpret uh, those types of uh, effects. In the Medicare, you'll heard that one of the unique things about Medicare, it is limited to the older population. All of the three pollutants were estimated at the one by one kilometer scale but they were averaged up. So they're averaged up to zip code. So the actual spatial resolution to which they are applied in the analysis is often quite a bit bigger than one by one kilometer. Um, the PM 2.5 association was robust to ozone. Um, and this is, this is wrong. <laughs> this is, um, uh, this was a, a result of so the previous, what I saw for the previous work. Um, in fact, the, uh, when both of them are included, there is attenuation of the PM 2.5 association. Uh, the NO2 and ozone associations uh, were largely unaffected with adjustment for PM 2.5. And, and in contrast uh, to other, the other studies, the ozone effect is, is positive here, uh, not negative. Issues that this brings up is the, uh, are, are, are the spatial scales uh, of the various pollutants, both in terms of the concentrations and in terms of the predictions, which we have to keep in mind in being able to make sense of these findings. The last point is, is moot at this point because of uh, an error in the earlier, earlier uh, slides. Now, confounding, I first start off with maple and I'm being very methodical and mechanical here and I'll try to blast through this relatively uh, quickly. You heard that confounding was addressed by adding uh, linear terms, linear co term covariance to the models um, and uh, making use of smaller cohorts that had uh, more extensive data on covariates that were missing in the larger data sets in order to enable an indirect control for this, these sets of confounders. Uh, importantly and reassuringly, there was a minimal impact of adjustment for these added variables. Um, but uh, one of the, one of the uh, findings that, uh, that you heard about in the MAPLE study was the fairly substantial variation in hazard ratios by region. Um, so um, one of the, issues that we're then faced with, what does this mean? Uh, is this residual confounding perhaps, or is it, is it actually the case that there is variation in PM toxicity uh, across uh, Canada, depending on the pollutant mix? The issue of, uh, of the effectiveness of the indirect control for missing confounders um, is an interesting one, one that we need to uh, perhaps address, although all the investigators that have done this have done something to try to validate uh, this approach to including uh, this larger array of confounders. In the lapse, again, confounders were added uh, to models. Um, in stages as was done in the MAPLE study. And again, an ancillary, ancillary data were used for additional uh, confounders. Um, in, in a lapse, we found that as the models became more elaborate, that has included more confounders, uh, there were varied effects uh, in, the, uh, in the administrative cohort, for example, four out of seven had increases in the hazard ratio. And importantly, this included Norway, which had which was the one that most country that most directly assessed the low concentration issue. Um, and then um, with respect to adding external confounders, it was a little bit all over the map. Some increased, some decreased, and it was difficult to make a conclusion with respect to the impact of adding other, other covariates. Um, again, the issue of addressing the indirect adjustment uh, is an interesting one. In the 
Medicare data set, again, also used ancillary data to provide data on uh, missing confounders. And this is the only, as you heard, the only study of the three so far, uh, which used causal inference methods. Uh, the findings were that PM 2.5 effects were essentially insensitive in the traditional approach to controlling confounding. And that was largely also the case when results from the causal inference uh, methods were uh, were, were shown, uh, although there was some um, in attenuation of effects using the causal inference method at low concentrations, which is of more direct interest to us here. Um, the issue of causal modeling is, is, is controversial and, you, and I'll come around to that just in a, in a bit as to, as to how we should uh, interpret uh, or weight them. Uh, there are advantages that we heard about in terms of of, of relaxing a lot of issues and concerns about model specification uh, and others, but there are assumptions that they make. And then there are, um, there are uh, uh, well, they, they, they essentially require data on measured confounders if they don't handle unmeasured confounding, which can be an issue. And, and uh, although the, the, the uh, Harvard group did address the issue of unmeasured confounders, in their uh, in their work, which is which is um, using something called an e-value, which I won't go into further, but needs uh, further assessment. Finally, with respect to concentration response functions, this is the arguably this is of the three topics the one that is most relevant to us here with respect to assessing the low concentration effect. So, uh, Canada maple. They, uh, as you saw, have the lowest PM concentrations of uh, all of the three studies. They use smoothing splines, which all of the groups did, uh, but also introduced this shift, the shape constrained health impact function. Uh, and originally, uh, this was this function was uh, only used here in this in this data set. It has now been applied in uh, in in uh, elapse as well. Uh, the last point uh, is not correct. They did do restricted analyses to at low concentrations, although perhaps not necessary given that Canada has such low concentrations to begin with. Findings were that you saw that there's a superlinear association that is steeper at low concentrations, uh, flattening out at higher concentrations. Um, the um, issues here, you saw the concentration response functions using the smoothing splines were very wiggly. And uh, that's, a little, that's a little puzzling. It's counterintuitively, uh, and counterintuitive. Um, the, uh, the question arises whether with some automatic approach to selecting knots, vocation and number, that the very, very large size of the data set somehow uh, makes it sensitive to, uh, well, makes it, makes it uh, uh, susceptible to showing a very wiggly uh, concentration response function. The SHIF is a, was an interesting approach. Uh, it's, the panel has thought it's still early days with the SHIF. It hasn't been vetted thoroughly in the, in the statistical or other communities. One of the puzzling issues that you saw in the, in the, in the, uh, dem the presentation was the, that the confidence intervals were narrowest at the lowest concentrations and then fanned out, which is problematic. I mean, we don't normally uh, say, see that. And, and, and it's uh, in the sense that normally we see wider confidence intervals at low concentrations and high concentrations where there's less data. So how to interpret these confidence intervals is a, is a challenge. And then there's the issue of flattening at the higher concentrations. Um, you know, these higher concentrations are not very high where it flattens. And, and many of you, of course, will, will recall that the sort of bread and butter work on air pollution and PM epidemiology was at these higher concentrations where we were seeing lots of associations. So the flattening is a little, is, is different. Uh, all right, uh, and then concentration response functions in Europe, but also a smoothly spline. They, they apply the shift later. They observe a superlinear association with flattening. Uh, and I've talked about the issue of flattening uh, before. One issue unique to elapse is you've got different countries. And the different countries have different concentrations. 
And so an issue to consider is how much of the shape of the concentration response function is, is just contributed by one country after the next as the, as the concentrations march up. So for example, the part contributed at low concentration in the administrative data set is weighted by Norway. Uh, so is it something peculiar about Norway that uh, weights that shape of the concentration response function? Finally, Medicare used, a, used also smoothing uh, and restricted uh, to low concentrations of this, as an assessment of, uh, of the low concentration effects. Uh, as opposed to the two other studies, their concentration response function was described as being pretty linear. That is not clearly a superlinear relationship, although, although the you saw that the effect estimates, the hazard ratios at concentrations less than 12 were quite a bit larger than those less than 12. And so one wonders whether, uh, why that concentration response, response function doesn't really adequately reflect uh, that observation. Um, in summary then, with respect to multi-pollutant modeling, uh, there was evidence for confounding by co-pollutants, but the issues of interpreting multi-pollutant models, even two-pollutant models, are, st are still with us, are problematic, and have not been resolved. That is still open to interpretation. We have the issue of different spatial scales, both of predictions and of the concentrations themselves. Um, and then the issue of ozone has reared its head here as to how to interpret ozone effect estimates and also how to interpret effect modification by ozone. Uh, and that is still, I think, an unresolved uh, issue. Uh, confounding control, uh, you saw there was some evidence that, or good evidence that the associations persisted with a lot of control for confounding. Um, the, we have now introduction of indirect methods to assist uh, in the quality of the data, that is the data that we need for being comfortable that we've got adequate covariate control or control of confounders. Um, we all want to conclude or exclude uh, whether the associations are causal or not. And we want to do that using traditional approaches. We've always tried to do that. That's, we say we're looking at associations, but our true interest is really in cause and effect. Uh, how do we weight findings from uh, causal inference methods? Those of you who were around for the synthesizing evidence session, the HEI session a few weeks ago, you heard one end of, of the, the spectrum of how this is observed, this is characterized, which is basically that this is just one other way in which we can approach the issue of addressing confounding. Um, as opposed to uh, what has been argued that we've now, we're now getting closer to a, a true experimental study as opposed to uh, observational studies. That is, we're, we're pretty much revolutionizing our approach to handling observational data. Uh, the jury is out uh, as to which of these will, will hold the day or is it going to be somewhere in between? And then finally, the issue of unmeasured confounders, uh, which uh, will require uh, more deliberation. They've got a lot of confounders that are being assessed in these, in these studies, and they've taken uh, great steps in terms of enhancing these large data sets uh, with other confounders. Uh, finally, the concentration response function. There are three approaches to sort of addressing low concentration effects. Uh, one is, and you've, you've heard them all, one is by restriction, that is just looking at uh, effects at low concentrations only, modeling the concentration response function, that is the shape, and then, and then finally a, a threshold analysis where you compare models um, that assume a threshold with models that don't assume a th threshold. Essentially, all the studies demonstrated, or the findings were, that there were low concentration associations. Um, they were mostly largely superlinear or linear. Um, we often hear the 
the notion that this indicates that there's most potential for harm at low levels, which for many of us is a difficult pill to swallow. Uh, it may not be so difficult if you consider a couple of things. Uh, one is the, uh, just sort of a thought example. Do we think that uh, the difference between five milligrams per cubic meter of PM 2.5 and 15 is the same as that between 40 and 50? And, you know, I think not. And that, that notion there may, may help in terms of understanding this apparent uh, superlinear association. Toxicology has been a very little help in the area of low concentration effects. Um, there is one notion in toxicology that is, a, that is an interesting one, uh, which is, is known as dose-dependent transitions, which basically means that the mechanisms of toxic or air pollutant effects changes uh, by concentration. So one mechanism at a low concentration is perhaps saturated, and then another mechanism kicks in at higher concentrations. Um, so there may be a way of trying to understand this from a mechanistic, uh, a mechanistic perspective. And the issue of shift needs to be uh, uh, more thoroughly assessed. Uh, and then finally, the third way of assessing low concentration effects has been threshold models. And, and essentially, we didn't see a lot of those results, but essentially the threshold models did not fit any better than the non-threshold models. Um, uh, arguing that uh, the, the linear or superlinear characterization of the function is, is probably reasonable. With respect to the review panel, a um, couple of things. Uh, we're, in this, we're in the process of completing commentaries cur currently um, of the three studies. And then finally, uh, we are going to pen an integrative synthesis of all three studies, uh, assessing many of the, of the themes that we've discussed here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this point, I would like to invite all our panelists to turn on their cameras uh, for the Q&A. And in addition, we'll welcome the PIs of the three studies, uh, Drs. Brower, Brenna Kreef, and Dominici. I'll give them a minute all to pop on. And for those of you who still have questions, please do um, keep putting those in the Q&A and we'll be watching that as we go on. All right, so we all kick off with a question uh, that was asked by Chad Bailey of the US EPA and he directed it to Tanya, but really it's a question for all of our speakers. And the question is, what's the quality of exposure assessment at the lowest exposure levels? For example, less than three and a half micrograms per cubic meter. Um, more generally, how did the different research groups evaluate their exposure estimates at these low levels and how similar were the methods for low level exposure assessment across the three groups? And I'll let you start, Tony. Uh, can I defer to, to Mike Brower on this one? <laughs> I'll, I'll take, I'll, I can answer in terms of maple. So we've actually done an evaluation where we, we've looked at, uh, so we have an exposure model um, and we've compared it to ground measurements uh, just, just as a way to evaluate. Um, not that ground measurements are necessarily always, always the, um, the best estimate of exposure. When we do that, however, we actually see uh, smaller errors at the lower concentrations compared to um, errors at the higher concentrations. So we don't actually see uh, a worsening of the relationship of our model estimates as we go to lower, uh, lower exposures. One of the other things that we did in Maple, um, we're, as you've heard, many of the studies are relying on a mix of uh, methodologies, including satellite-based estimates. We did specific um, ground monitoring uh, at locations of low concentrations in Canada. Uh, to refine the relationship between uh, satellite-based estimates and ground monitoring, also understanding the role of composition. So we really tried uh, in Maple to tweak the model uh, towards low concentrations. So I would say it's at least as appropriate 
Uh, the approaches that we've used are least as appropriate for low concentrations as they are for other concentrations. Um, and the, the, the differences between the, 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 um, the studies, so there, there are differences, they're all using combinations of, of tools. Also, I would say the exposure levels and the distribution of exposures are quite different across the different cohorts. So it may not be appropriate to do exactly the same thing. Um, and also where the, the cohorts are, urban, rural, et cetera, um, national, restricted you know, to specific cities. Um, in the ongoing work and the harmonized analysis, we are going to be applying the same exposure estimate to all of the cohorts. Um, so that will be one, one way to sort of uh, evaluate, I guess, the sensitivity to exposure. Um, but having said that, again, I think it's really important to remember that the cohorts are different. Um, and where people are and the characteristics of the cohorts are different. So this is never going to be a perfect experiment of the, the uh, effect of, uh, of exposure models. And others can join in, Bert, Francesca. I can jump in. So um, like Mike, so we actually compared our um, estimates from our um, PM prediction model to actually EPA monitors. And we see actually low lower error in the um, low concentrations than the higher concentrations. Yeah, we haven't made that assessment formally. If, uh, if I remember correctly, we've published our uh, exposure work a while ago. And uh, we've ex extensively validated against ground, ground level uh, monitoring with a whole lot of validation techniques, et cetera. I don't think we see much difference between the different cohorts uh, studied at different levels of exposure, for example. But a strictly formal assessment uh, of the validity at different uh, bins of the concentration range, I don't think we've done that. Um, Amy, uh, I think I'll, uh, there was a couple, a couple of questions addressing the issue of measurement error as it relates to the, the very important issue of the shape of the concentration response function, one by David Bassard. And, uh, and, and Leanne Shepard as well. So David Bassard said, one of the arguments heard about the shape of the dose response curves is that epidemiology can have errors in exposure measurements that might yield a more linear dose response relationship between the imperfect estimates of exposure and the data on health responses, even if the health effect were highly uh, nonlinear or even if there were a threshold. Uh, for PM, there might be an argument that even if the threshold for responses to individual chemicals that are part of PM, the multiple chemical specific threshold might result in a smooth response as a mixture. So he would be interested to hear thoughts about uh, how the work informs whether either of these occurs in the epi studies of PM, that is the measurement error uh, resulting in uh, a linear relationship when their fact is, is a, a threshold and also perhaps the issue of a multi-pollutant uh, effect or, or contribution of PM that results in linearization of the, of the, uh, of the response. And Dr. Shepard, Leanne Shepard said she's interested in a more full discussion of the rationale for differential measurement error in these studies. So maybe I can start and comment on some of the work that we've been doing on measurement error, which um, we have doing quite we have been doing quite a bit on it. So um, we did uh, apply a regression calibration approach to um, to try to adjust for the measurement error. Uh, essentially, the regression calibration model was fit um, on the EPA monitors, and we were able to then predict, quote, true concentrations for the entire U.S. Uh, well, for New, for New England was in our publication, and now for um, we've expanded this to the entire U.S. as part of ongoing work. Um, the estimates so far have been um, robust to, uh, to the adjustment, which is good and still statistically um, significant. Uh, and then we, we have a whole, actually, another grant on uh, kind of uncertainty and trying to uh, potentially ensemble different uh, exposure models to see if that can um, kind of help in terms of get um, even more robust estimates for the exposure. And then we do have ongoing work um, in, in a couple of areas, both from um, a Bayesian modeling perspective to really try to propagate actually the uncertainty that we do see all the way through um, from the exposure estimate all the way through into the outcome model. So it's something that has definitely been on our mind and um, 
research that we are excited about and is kind of ongoing and I think is, is important and um, hopefully we'll have public, more publications soon. <laughs> so I don't know, Francesca, if you want to add to that or before we... No, I think, okay. I think, I think you said it all. Thank you, Danielle. The difficult question is what the gold standard is to assess measurement error in these uh, studies. And we've done a couple of projects in, in the past uh, using personal monitoring in small groups because you can't do personal monitoring in large groups to try to establish the correlation between the estimates that we use in the EPI for the outdoor studies and the personal monitoring. But, uh, you know, as for the cross, for the um, spatial uh, contrasts, those correlations tend to be not all that high because the spatial contrasts are not all that high. So small errors in the measurement of the gold standard can easily produce uh, low correlations between the data you use in the EPI and the personal monitoring results in the panel studies that we did. Uh, together with the Harvard group, we did do some regression calibrations, but especially when these correlations are small, you can easily find, you know, five-fold inflations of the regression coefficients or the effect estimates after adjusting for measurement error that way. And we've been very hesitant to see that as uh, a better assessment, a better estimate than the one that we get from using the outdoor concentrations alone. I'll just, just add, we, we've done a couple things also to sort of look at this, uh, maybe a little bit differently. One of the things we did was looked at, at different uh, basically spatial uh, resolutions of our exposure models. So you can, you can imagine, for example, um, I think people would like to think that, that the more precise uh, spatial resolution, the better, but people are actually mobile. So we, we looked, for example, at one kilometer, 10 kilometer, maybe to account for mobility. We also did different sizes for the age of the population. So for example, thinking that older individuals may be less mobile than younger, um, that really didn't have much of an effect at all. Um, in all cases, the, the more refined exposure um, uh, seem to be basically give us um, better models and, and higher exposure estimates as, as you might expect. But actually the main point that, that I'd like to bring up when people think about exposure measurement error, they're always thinking spatial, there's also a temporal error. Um, and one of the things just to highlight, um, certainly in Maple and, and apologies to the other studies, I can't remember exactly what was done. Um, we actually have annual residential histories for every individual in the cohort. So we're adjusting for changes in address um, over time as people are, are being followed up in, in the cohort. So that, in my view, is actually a greater source of exposure measurement error than, than the spatial uh, aspects or sort of the personal monitoring because um, that kind of thing, you'd have to actually assume that this is sort of differential um, ambient to personal relationships across individuals. And, and, and I think that that's a, sometimes a tough argument. So. All right, so we've gotten a lot of questions uh, about statistical analysis, which makes me very happy. Uh, so you can see some books behind me. Uh, so I wanted to bring up uh, the most popular topic, which seems to be splines. So we've received a number of questions about them, ranging from the basic definition of splines to how the modeling approaches themselves address the possibility of overfitting and the type of penalty for not selection. So just kind of as a broad overview, um, splines are flexible smoothers and they're an attempt to model complex functions without forcing weird relationships in the tails that you might get from using a really high order polynomial. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that if um, that, that a straight line fit with a slope of zero is possible using a spline. So if there's no association, uh, we would expect a spline to reflect that. Uh, though a detailed discussion of splines is unfortunately uh, beyond the scope today. But I would like to ask the researchers to talk more about they have, how they approach the possibility of overfitting, how they addressed model adequacy and model fit, and how they made choices among the possible dose response parameterizations. Who'd like to start? Okay, I'll pick on Francesca. I was I, I can take this. <laughs> Danielle, but yeah. I can take it as to some extent. So I think it's a really good question. I think it's it's really challenging. And um, we have been actually 
diving more and more into the exposure response modeling in, in recent months. And especially as a side note, we've been doing some analysis by subgroups, which has been really interesting, but it, it kind of raised, it, it's, it, it seems like modeling choices may be even more sensitive when you start looking at, at certain subpopulations, say uh, racial, different racial groups. So, so it's definitely something that we've been thinking a lot about recently. Uh, I, I have just one comment on maybe on, related to kind of the multi-pollutant aspect of this modeling. So. Um, for, for us, like we, we ended up including the other pollutants as actually terms in our generalized propensity score model. So um, they're not actually in the outcome model, which I think helps kind of might help with the overfitting. So uh, I just wanted to point that out, but I, I think it's challenging. I, I, the more I, like, personally, the more I dive into it, the more challenging I realize the modeling is. So, so if I could also just quickly comment, I think we also have been paying extremely amount of attention of thinking about causal modeling in the exposure response function, yeah. actually thinking about to uh, match individuals at different level of exposure. And so I also want to comment a little bit about, you know, some of the statement is very made. I mean, in terms of whether causal inference is a revolution. Well, I wanted to point it out that causal inference has been around for over 25 years, and there have been over 45 books, as much as I know, that have been reading on causal inference methods. So I do think that, you know, the inability to implement some of these causal inference methods should, be given, should not be given license to criticize. There has been an enormous, um, you know, um, group of statisticians that have been spending the last 20 years of how to approximate an observational study into a randomized trial. Are they perfect? Not. Are they better? I think yes. And also I wanted to correct about the statement, which is, you know, just basically wrong, that causal inference method cannot just for a measure confounding. I think that causal inference method and some of the methods that we have done in peer reviewed and many of other colleagues do adjust for a measure confounding, including a recent publication of George Wurz, which used difference and difference estimation. So I do think I'm not the strongest advocate of causal inference methods, but I do think that we need to recognize the level of sophistication and modernize, and I think it's time for, cause for environmental epidemiology to embrace the fact that these methods have been around for, for a very long time. And so I think that in terms of addressing the question of causal modeling and exposure response function, with causal modeling and adequacy of, of modeling assumption, we can, we can actually assess whether or not the measure confounders are indeed balanced at different level of exposure. And that I think is, you know, as have been chosen, a much more robust approach to adjust for measure confounding in the context of flexible exposure response. Good, thank you. I, I wanted to I wanted to change gears uh, just a bit uh, and uh, use a, a question from Stephanie London to address this issue. And her her main concern is the issue of still adequacy for uh, control of of confounding and specifically focusing on smoking, even though, you know, there are the ancillary data sets that are used to supplement uh, confounder control in the in the larger uh, cohorts uh, using the indirect adjustment methods. Her concern is that the that the smoking adjustment is still relatively crude and that there is still some uh, substantial residual confounding or potential for substantial residual confounding in this case, for example, from cigarette smoking. So I guess I would ask uh, maybe perhaps each of the cohorts to sort of address the issue of uh, the adequacy of, of say control for smoking, which is such an important predictor of mortality. So first of all, uh, can I just quickly reply? I mean, let's let's also keep in mind again, I think there is, an, there is really a misunderstanding here of what is a confounder and the distinction between what is a confounder and what is the predictor of the outcome. And I think after 20 years, it seems there is still confusion on that. So smoking is indeed a very strong risk factor for mortality. But the fact that smoking is a, is a confounder has to be related to inhalation of outdoor exposure to pollution. And so far, data have not provided a strong evidence that there is a relationship that 
you know, between smoking and exposure to pollution. So I am actually quite surprised that after all so long, including making comments about causal inference, that there is still misunderstanding of what is a what is a confounder. Having said that, I think what we have done is we have used data from the Medicare Code and Beneficiary Survey that use individual level smoking and to assess whether or not smoking is a confounder. So whether or not there is a strong uh, evidence that people that are smokers live in more polluted area. And that is actually not, not, not clear, including you know, doing an, doing full analysis of that just for smoking. And so that's, I think, also why I think there is still a lot of confusion and misunderstanding of what are really the important issue. Good, thank you. A few um, um, remarks good, yeah. uh, on that as well, I think. Uh, the, the relationship between smoking and air pollution varies from time in time and it varies from place to place. So you can't just say that if you have not adequately adjusted for smoking that you have a problem in the sense that you're overestimating the air pollution effects. And I think as was remarked uh, by some today, seeing the uh, effects of the indirect adjustments going in different directions in the, in the, the six uh, elapsed cohorts actually speaks to that, I think. If I remember correctly, Mike, in the Canadian study, you also see, uh, you know, effect estimates moving from uh, no or even negative to, to positive after adjustment for more and more potential confounders, which is opposite to what most people think it will happen if you do adjustment for uh, potential confounders. In escape, we actually, which is now a while ago, we actually did see that uh, adjustment for smoking did make a difference. So it was, uh, for most of the endpoints, it was very important to, to look at that. But we also noted that it's much more important when you look at lung cancer than, than to most of the other endpoints, <clears throat> because smoking is such a big risk factor for lung cancer. So there you may, may go wrong more easily. And, and that's why we, in, in Escape, for example, we restricted our analysis to cohorts, which really had very detailed information on, on smoking habits uh, when we addressed uh, lung cancer. And finally, um, most of these cohorts are looking at smoking also as an effect modifier. And in non-smokers, smoking is hard or impossible to be a confounder. So, you know, focusing on what happens in non-smokers, lifelong non-smokers is, is an important argument. And that's the majority of the population in most places that I know of. An important argument to, to look at when you think you run into discussions about whether or not these associations are to a large extent explained by smoking. These are just a few observations which I think are important. That's excellent. And I, I'm aware that our time uh, has almost gone. Uh, just like at a regular in-person meeting, uh, we, we do have some time maybe uh, for one more question and, and push the schedule a little bit. And so I wanted to pick up on uh, David Spink's question about thresholds. Um, and so in particular, he said, based on the results, it seems like maybe there's a, a no effect threshold um, in the range of two to three micrograms per cubic meters for PM 2.5, but no threshold for NO2. So can people comment uh, on that? I think in the threshold model that I showed, we had the most, uh, uh, the strongest evidence in 2.5 to 3.5. So I can't speak to the NO2, but I think also in the Canadian study, we have, most people have low levels of exposure, but you know, in a lapse, there aren't people with, or a lot of people with 2.5 to 3.5. So it's not necessarily easy to be uh, exploring that in certain cohorts, but I can't, if anybody else wants to, uh, Talk about NO2, feel free. I think some of, some of the graphs shown from the Harvard team suggest that thresholds for NO2 and not for PM, but that's certainly not what we're seeing in uh, any labs. Of course, you can't go, you can't make a, a statement on anything that's lower than the lowest observed concentrations and preferably a little bit above that. The, th the threshold models that we ran uh, consistently showed that, you know, whenever you put in a threshold, the fit of the model is, is worse than when you they do not put in a threshold for what that's for what that's worth, but that's an observation that we had. 
and the, the simple uh, censoring approach that we did, the subset approach that we did was also not uh, supporting thresholds anywhere near the levels of air quality guidelines and standards. And that's the, the, the important policy implication, I think. If we can convince ourselves that these associations persist well below current guidelines and standards, then we have an important policy message, regardless of whether, this, whether there is a threshold at one or two or three microns per meter cube, because that's not a very relevant policy question for the next 25 years, I guess. The, the only thing I'll add, um, I have nothing more to add on, on PM 2.5. I, I agree completely with the other comments. Um, and, and I don't really think we've looked at this at all for NO2, but for ozone, we actually do see evidence. Uh, you know, we haven't looked at it formally, but we do see sort of evidence of a threshold where there, there is a range of concentrations where we do see no effect. And then the, the risk starts to increase at, at higher concentrations. That, however, I'll point out again, that could be more where ozone is high rather than actually the, the effect of ozone. So it may be reflecting something else, either about the cohorts or the multi-pollutant mixture. I, super quick, I just wanna say this is a really important question. We are doing additional work to um, try to quantify evidence of threshold and, and quantify evidence of where the threshold is gonna be in the Medicare study doing a Bayesian version of um, doing a Bayesian estimates of the de derivative of the exposure response curve. So just because of that, this is such an important topic. That's great to hear. And it sounds like uh, even though we're coming to the end of our session and of our studies, there's still a lot of work for people to do. Uh, we really appreciate our speakers and their work on this important topic. And now I will turn things back over to Eliane Van Fleet. Thanks very much, Amy. Um... Okay, I'm not able to share the screen. Um, in any case, uh, in closing, we want to thank the speakers and chairs uh, for this thought-provoking session on health effects from exposures to low levels of air pollution. Um, and please visit our website to find recordings and slides of this webinar and all our previous uh, in the series. And also to help improve our webinars, we'd be grateful if you could complete the post webinar survey, which will be emailed to you tomorrow. Um, we wanna thank all the attendees from all over the world for joining us today for our final webinar in our series. And we really hope you'll join us next April in Washington, DC uh, for our annual conference. And you can find more information on, uh, on our website. Thank you again, and we wish you all good health. <laughs>